could be any day anywhere in the world. A storm is brewing. Hurricane or earthquake, famine or war, drought or disease, many problems know no borders. No country can solve them alone. As the hurricane advances across the ocean, it is tracked by satellite. Ships are directed to the shelter of safe harbors. And in the skies, air traffic controllers alert the world's airlines. It's cooperation made possible by the work of several United Nations agencies. They're just one part of an international system that shapes our world in ways large and small. Since World War II, the United Nations has sought to avert war, resolve conflicts, and limit armaments. Today, its mission has grown to encompass much more, humanitarian relief, health care, and economic development for the neediest. In fact, in just about every aspect of human endeavor, the United Nations is an indispensable part of the reality of people everywhere. <laughs> The UN affects individual lives in ways that people can't even imagine. And, that, and here I'm talking about the everyday life of the average citizen, whether the individual lives in a poor country or a rich country. A vital focus of the United Nations is people in need. In all matter of emergencies, whether natural or man-made, UN workers are there, coordinating relief efforts. Very often, the refugees flee to poor, still developing countries, and then we have to go to assist their refugee camps. Innocent men, women, and children forced to flee their homes, but with nowhere to go. At home was war. We never knew who was fighting. We were sad to leave, and one day we want to return home. In most cases, refugees are the victims of war. Every day, conflicts kill and maim thousands of people, the vast majority civilians. The resolution of conflict and the pursuit of peace lie at the heart of the United Nations existence. Founded in the wake of World War II, its originating charter declared that its members were determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. The UN's weapons in its pursuit of peace are sanctions against countries that start wars and the brokering of ceasefire agreements when the opposing sides are ready. To monitor ceasefires or sanctions, the familiar blue helmeted or blue beret multinational peacekeeping forces are deployed to many of the most troubled places on earth. Their work is often critical to establish a lasting peace between warring parties. They need the authority of the United Nations to, to create that space where they are strong enough uh, to go for peace, but they don't get to trust each other. And that's where the peacekeepers come in. Peacekeeping got underway in 1948 when military advisors monitored a ceasefire between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Since then, almost a million military, civilian, and police personnel from more than 100 countries have participated in peacekeeping operations around the world. From the United Nations headquarters in New York, peacekeepers are dispatched by the Security Council. In this temple of the United Nations, we are the guardians of an ideal, the guardians of a conscience. The 15-nation council with five permanent members with veto power and ten elected members who serve two-year terms is the body primarily responsible for maintaining peace. It also assists countries to rebuild from the ashes of war by sending peacekeepers to demine, training local police forces, and reintegrating former combatants into a civilian workforce. And to help democracy take hold, the UN has assisted in elections in over 70 countries. This is an organization that stands up for the little one. This is an organization that has principles and ideals which serve the individual. 
Respect for the freedom and the dignity of every human being is at the core of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Member countries have signed more than 80 treaties to guarantee these rights. The UN brings the plight of the abused and the oppressed to the attention of the world and confronts the governments involved. Two women were detained by the military and detained in the military barracks here, which seems to me to be completely illegal. By tackling the root causes of conflict, like poverty and social injustice, the UN seeks to prevent rather than just react to political instability. The UN's charter calls for the promotion of higher standards of living, economic and social progress. Over the years, this has become one of the highest priorities of the UN system. The UN development activities are everywhere. Development is allowing people to work in their natural location, homes and environment to make themselves self-sustaining. The UN Development Program, or UNDP, runs projects in over 170 countries. It works with other UN agencies, as well as governmental and voluntary organizations, to help communities support themselves. UN projects, like this woman's poultry farm cooperative in Nepal, help women earn a living. I want people to say, look, she was so poor, and through her efforts, she was able to improve her situation. In the Bolivian Andes, UNDP trains farmers to modernize their irrigation systems and diversify their crops. This has benefited the entire community very much. Thanks to this project, thanks to our product, we now have an economic profit. More than a billion people on Earth, one-sixth of the world's population, subsist on less than one U.S. dollar a day. At a special summit to set priorities for the new millennium, U.N. member states set target dates to cut the number of people living in absolute poverty in half. They pledge to improve housing for people who live in slums and to provide safe drinking water to all. In an age when human beings have learned the code of human life. No mother in the world can understand why her child should be left to die of malnutrition or preventable disease. The Millennium Development Goals also aim to bring primary education to both boys and girls everywhere and to halt the spread of HIV, AIDS, and other major diseases. The World Health Organization, working with other UN agencies, carries out global immunization campaigns that save two and a half million lives every year. That, along with such improvements as safer drinking water, has led to increased life expectancy in many parts of the world. But no disease has devastated whole communities as quickly as HIV AIDS. It is a humanitarian disaster of global proportions. Tens of millions are living with the virus. More people become infected every day. We must protect those made most vulnerable by the epidemic, especially orphans. Millions of children today have lost one or both of their parents to AIDS. And they are growing up malnourished, undereducated, marginalized, and at risk of being infected themselves. African countries have been particularly hard hit. UN backed AIDS awareness campaigns teach people how to protect themselves against the virus. There are so many families which got infected. As I always say, every year there are more people who suffer. Hunger is another daunting global problem. The World Food Program combats famine and malnutrition by providing about one-third of the world's food aid every year. Much of that food is distributed to countries in crisis, but WFP also provides school children with a nutritious daily meal to help them study and stay in school longer. 
the World Food Program is specialized in providing food aid to those uh, who are uh, hungry. FAO is there to help them produce their own uh, food, particularly by controlling their environment, the water, uh, the rural infrastructure, and using modern uh, uh, tools like seed fertilizer. There is also a special organization solely dedicated to children, UNICEF. It has been working since 1946 to meet the needs of children and has programs in some 160 countries around the world. We work around really simple kinds of activities. It might be the immunization of children to fight polio or measles. It might be the access to clean water that might be pumped in a community. It's helping to encourage kids to go to school. So it could be training teachers or supporting the school with materials like books and pencils and paper. Just very simple things. Ensuring a better future for the world also involves taking care of the Earth itself, safeguarding its natural resources. The UN promotes alternative technologies that enable nations and communities to improve their quality of life without polluting the environment. You must be aware where the environment is damaged, there are very, very negative consequences for human beings. The United Nations has taken the lead in global efforts that have provided safe drinking water for 1.3 billion people. The multifaceted work of the United Nations and its nearly 40 specialized agencies is supported by more than 190 member states. As the world changes, so too will the UN's challenges. Today's real borders are not between nations, but between powerful and powerless, free and fettered, privileged and humiliated. The accomplishments of the United Nations were recognized in 2001 when the organization and its Secretary General were awarded the Centennial Nobel Peace Prize. Today, no wars can separate humanitarian or human rights crises in one part of the world from national security crises in another. Because beneath the surface of states and nations, ideas and language, lies the fate of individual human beings in need. Answering their needs will be the mission of the United Nations in the century to come. The United Nations continues to promote peace and security, development and human rights around the world. It is the only universal organization that belongs to all the peoples of the world, bringing them together to share resources and knowledge and to build a better future for us all. War and conflict, hope for a better life. They are the tragedies and triumphs of an era, and for nearly 60 years, the United Nations has been there. At the center of its commitment, the UN Security Council, with a mission to advance peace and order around the world. This chamber has witnessed some of the most dramatic confrontations of our age. We cannot have peace in the island. Decisions made here have reflected the times and shaped millions of lives. The loss of life in the Holy Land must be brought to an immediate end. 
Images of the Council are seen globally, its resolutions making headline news. Yet few really know how it works from the inside, how it has changed, and the challenges it faces for the future. Diplomats, the media, and officials heading for a council meeting at the United Nations headquarters in New York City. It's a scene that has taken place thousands of times. This is United Nations Radio. Interpreters get ready to translate into six official languages. Delegates wait for the council president to call them to order. The tradition began almost 60 years ago. San Francisco, 1945. 51 countries signed the Charter of the United Nations, vowing to save future generations from the scourge of war. Long live the United Nations. The cornerstone of this new organization, the Security Council, one of its six divisions. Under the UN Charter, the Council was granted broad powers to resolve threats to peace and respond to outbreaks of conflict. The original conception of the UN during World War II uh, was to bring the major powers of the world together so that they could enforce the peace. Five major powers were made permanent members of the Security Council. China, France, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Known as the P5, each could veto a motion to defeat it. Chapter 6 of the Charter outlines steps for the peaceful settlement of disputes. Chapter 7 states how the Council can enforce its decisions using sanctions or even military action. It wasn't long before the Council heard its first case. In January 1946, it acted on a complaint by Iran against the Soviet Union, which had troops in the northern part of its country. During the Cold War, the two superpowers each used their vetoes to block the other's resolution. The Council was often deadlocked. The two vetoes by the Soviet Union have prevented the adoption of two resolutions. In fact, it was only under extraordinary circumstances that the Council responded decisively to the Korean crisis in 1950. Communist forces from the North had invaded the South in an attempt to unify the country. And called upon the authorities of North Korea to withdraw forthwith their armed forces to the 38th battalion. The Soviets, boycotting the Council, were not present to vote. Their absence allowed the other members to approve the first use of UN force. It would be the only authorized military action for the next 40 years. Nobody actually, uh, in 1945, I think, foresaw that the Cold War would set in quite so soon with such devastating results. With the threat of nuclear disaster, the stakes were higher than ever. The result, in 1962, one of the most dramatic confrontations in Council history. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? <laughs> I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. To get past stalemates between the two superpowers, the Council had to be creative. Through a resourceful interpretation of its powers, it came up with a solution of peacekeeping, which both sides could endure. And peacekeeping was really, in the Cold War, a means of containing regional conflicts, which, if they weren't contained, might trigger off the East-West nuclear conflict. From the Congo to Kashmir, Cyprus to Suez, the Security Council authorized some 18 peacekeeping missions during the Cold War. More than 100 countries contributed soldiers, police, and civilians. The signature blue berets and blue helmets of the United Nations became a familiar component of diplomacy. A peacekeeping was recognized that it could be part of a peace process part of a negotiation uh, that didn't have to be coercive. 
It was also an era of rapid decolonization, and membership in the United Nations was growing. By 1964, the organization included 115 states. In 1965, the number of elected council members was enlarged from 6 to 10, each with a two-year term. For a resolution to pass now, nine of 15 member votes were required. The P5, however, still retained their veto power. One against, two abstentions. As the Cold War thawed in the late 1980s, and the East-West superpowers were no longer in conflict, there were signs that the Council could provide effective UN enforcement. Mr. President, please help my country. The use of force after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1991 was a watershed moment in Council history. It was the first time since Korea that military action had been authorized. That was a remarkable event which showed that the new spirit is prevailing, new form new style, new content of cooperation was there. And during the 1990s, a variety of UN sanctions, from economic to travel bans to arms embargoes, were imposed on at least 10 nations and non-government groups. But the post-Cold War world presented new challenges, such as shifting political landscapes. The sense of uh, the countries of Eastern Europe falling apart, uh, in the sense of uh, new countries being created and being created in a very violent fashion, some of them, uh, the, uh, the civil wars. By 1993, the cost of UN peacekeeping peaked at 3.6 billion US dollars per year. Yet early successes in Namibia, El Salvador, and Mozambique were followed by tragic failures in Rwanda, Somalia, and the former Yugoslavia. It became clear that a new approach was needed. In East Timor and later Kosovo, the task went far beyond that of traditional peacekeeping. I think that uh, the main difference is that the Security Council has found that if you want to have sustainable peace, you cannot address just the military side uh, in a post-conflict situation. And so you do need to have a, a multi-dimensional operation that addresses civilian as well as military aspects. To cope with the broadening demands of peacekeeping and the challenges of nation building, the Council began relying more on regional initiatives. During the Liberian Civil War, West African peacekeepers were the first to be deployed. On behalf of the Secretary General of the United Nations, we are here this morning to wish you Godspeed, to wish you well in your historic mission to Liberia. The last decade of the 20th century also brought further threats, including weapons of mass destruction and new responses. Weapons inspectors were sent to Iraq. We're ready to go, and there are two cars blocking our way. We are inspectors. We want out. You're allowed to do the us then, with a new millennium, came a more terrifying challenge to peace and security. And on the 28th of September, 2001, the Security Council adopted Resolution 1373, which established the Counterterrorism Committee and mandatory measures under Chapter 7 of the Charter for all member states to implement to combat terrorism. The committee's purpose is to monitor the execution of Resolution 1373, which requires states to combat terrorism through rigorous financial regulations, border controls, and law enforcement. It's now become part of a heavy agenda the Council faces day in and day out. When I was ambassador here from 85 to 89, if you look at the relative uh, standing or the work of the Security Council, the Security Council was this much, the General Assembly was this much in terms of work. When I came back uh, 15 years later, the Security Council has gone up this way and the General Assembly has shrunk. Guiding the work is the Council President, a position that rotates on a monthly basis among members. On this day, the United Kingdom's ambassador is assuming that role. In terms of 
how I would like to relate to you, ladies and gentlemen, it is to be as open and as accessible as I possibly can be. Much of the Council's diverse program is planned in advance. Meetings take place in a number of formats, from public or private meetings in the chamber to closed informal consultations in an adjacent room. In 1992, the Council even began inviting non-governmental organizations to take part, allowing them to provide information on issues the Council would be taking up. But not all work happens during meetings at the UN. In the last decade, information gathering has brought Council members into the field, like this visit to Central Africa. Such missions have been a worthwhile innovation and sometimes help to broker agreements. And go there and meet the people, to see the fear, it's a completely uh, insight and revelation to many of us, which gives content to what we're doing. Despite this versatility, a representative of each member state must always be on hand near UN headquarters so the Council can handle crises as they arise. And as events leading up to the second Iraqi conflict revealed, there can still be dramatic divisions when trying to reach a decision. In early 2003, Iraq's disregard of council resolutions to disclose weapons created tensions not seen since the Cold War days. There were deep divisions over potential military action, and among the P-5, stalemate. But how much longer are we willing to put up with Iraq's noncompliance before we, as a council, we as the United Nations say, enough, enough. Wanting to take action, the United States and the United Kingdom proposed use of force to overthrow Saddam Hussein's regime without the backing of China, Russia, or France. To what extent do the nature and scope of the threat justify the recourse to force? How do we make sure that the tremendous risks of such intervention are actually kept under control? For the United Nations and its many members, Preemptive military action without council support is a troubling concept, especially if undertaken by the world's most powerful nations. My concern is that if it were to be adopted, it would set precedents that resulted in the proliferation of the unilateral and lawless use of force with or without justification. Today, many critics say the Council is a vestige of World War II that doesn't reflect new world realities and increase UN membership, now 191 countries. Questions about its future remain. Should the Council be enlarged? If so, by how much? If there were new permanent seats, which countries would get them? Should the veto power be retained? Would any of these changes even help to make the Council more effective? Issues like these have been debated for more than a decade. Now, responding to recent events, the Secretary General has urged UN members to take some action. If you want the Council and the Council's decisions to command greater respect, particularly in the developing world, you need to address the issue of its composition with greater urgency. For six decades, the United Nations Security Council has worked to keep peace and order and to build a better world, often undertaking tasks its founders never envisioned. A unique global system, it must continue to evolve with the people, politics, and our changing times as it strives to fulfill its mission. <laughs>